Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. I love that we serve a God that does not hold our past against us, but holds our future in front of us. That we can see the things that we need to pursue. I just, I love that. I love it, I love it, I love it. Hey, uh, you know, I've been in those series uh, the last year about relationships, making friends, finding your tribe. And uh, earlier this year, I was able to go on a fishing trip with a bunch of pastors. It's a time of unwinding, just be a guy, go deep sea fishing. Man, we caught so many, we caught like a hundred something fish that day. It was awesome. But anyway, during that trip, um, I, I was invited there by a pastor who didn't know who I was. He had never heard anything about me. He invited me on this trip and said, hey man, I'd love you to come alongside of us and have a great time fishing, hanging out. And when I got there, it was one of those divine connections. One of those things where your soul just kind of con connects to another guy. You get along, you enjoy each other's company. You don't have to work really hard to have conversations. It was just one of those moments. And I was like, man, I wanna do life with this guy. I want to do ministry with him, and I want to ensure that he's part of my life and I'm part of his. And so I want to welcome you guys, or welcome today, a friend of mine and a friend of Family Church. He is now family, Pastor Josh Lipscomb from Pensacola, Florida. Love you, guys. Yeah, buddy. All right. Awesome. You can sit down. Appreciate you guys. So good to be here. It's really my honor, and uh, it's a great church. I don't know if you know this or not, but this is a really, really good church. Yeah, yeah, you're blessed. Why don't you look at your neighbor and say you're looking good today. Go ahead, you're looking good. All right, look to your second choice and say you look good too. Don't leave him out. You know, it's been great to be here for a few days. I got to come in early and go to the men's event on Friday. Wasn't that amazing? I texted my wife afterwards, said, I got to get a crossbow. <laughs> She's like, who is this man? But, but it's been great to be able to be here and to see uh, this amazing church. This is a great church, and I love the heart of this church, seeing the baptisms and hearing about Celebrate Recovery, all that God is doing. And, um, and you know that great churches aren't made by accident, but they're really, they're really great churches that are led well. And I got to spend a lot of time with Pastor Mike and their team here, and uh, I don't know if you know this or not, but you're very blessed to have the leaders that you have, the pastors that you have on this team. And when I first met Pastor Mike, the first thing that went through my head was, that is a really good beard. <laughs> I had some beard envy. My wife won't let me grow it out like that. I'm thinking, man, I want to be like that. And I got to hear his passion and, and see his heart for this church. And, uh, you know, so you pull onto this property and you see everything done with excellence and just a, a, real, a real passion for details and the people that are around. And, and so I just want to take a moment and honor my friend. And I want you to join with me in honoring Pastor Mike McKelvey and Cynthia. Such amazing, amazing leaders. Yeah, I mean it. Yeah. Yeah. Love you, man. He's the real deal. And some of y'all are like, man, he's not preaching today. I'm disappointed. <laughs> and it's all right. Join us next week. It'll be a good time. But I just want to share something simple. And uh, before I do, I want to show a picture of my family. Here's a picture of my family. Yeah. That's my girlfriend in the middle. Uh, we've been, we'll be married 18 years this summer, so we're almost adults. We're just figuring it out now. It's my son Jonah on the left, he's 13, Caleb's on the right, he's 16, amazing. Family's everything to me, and so, uh, you know, my son Caleb, who's on the right there, turned 16 a few months ago, and uh, got his driver's license, and you parents out there that have been through that know the sheer terror, and at the same time, amazing joy that comes along with that. Uh, you know, seeing him all for the first time driving by himself was scary and sad because I thought to myself, I'll never get to take him to school again. <laughs> and then I thought about it and was like, I'll never get to take him to school again. This is amazing. <laughs> so, you know, we have our own built-in DoorDash now. He can run errands for us. It's a wonderful thing. But 
Come on, life is good. Life is good. And um, I want to start with a, a story, and this is a true story. Okay, I know pastors, maybe you shouldn't have to qualify it like that, but this really happened. And I was about 13 years old, and maybe you can relate to this, but there was a girl that lived next door to us. I saw her every day because she had an older brother, and I rode to school with them. And when I first met him, I didn't think much about it, but somehow, somewhere along the way, she went from someone I thought nothing about to someone that, that consumed all of my thoughts. Like, she was my first real crush. Remember your first real crush? I mean, we were in love. I was in love with her. Our future, you know, was secure, and I, you know, we dreamed about, I dreamed of, it wasn't a we, it was just me. I dreamed about it. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, it was before social media, and uh, so you couldn't just, like, stalk someone from a distance, and you had to, like, actually, if you wanted them to know you cared about them, you had to actually say something to them and do something. You couldn't send them a little message, you know, a little courage behind the screen. So it was a, it was a difficult day back then, and I was a shy kid. And so I had this thing that was swelling, and I was making mixtapes at night, thinking about her, and, <laughs> and so... I, I don't, something had to be done. I had to, I had to say something. I didn't know what to say. And I had to express, you know, what I felt about her. And so in a rare moment of courage, I gathered all the money that I had and I got on my bike, rode across town, went to the grocery store and into the floral section of the grocery store. And I bought a dozen yellow roses and I got a little card, paid for it, $18 worth of pennies on the cash register. And I rode my bike home and uh, wrote a little something on the card about how much I cared about her. She cared about me too. Then, you know, let me know. And I got the roses and I went over to her house. And I never forget standing there. You can picture a little kid with a dozen roses and a card in hand standing on the front porch of this house. And I remember looking at the doorbell. And like my fingers go in to press the doorbell and it's like two inches away from the doorbell. And I thought to myself, those two inches represent a serious step of faith. <laughs> like the moment I ring that doorbell, it's going to, a series, a, tri a series of events are going to be triggered, you know, to bring me into my future. Right. And so I didn't think, my, I didn't think about it. I just pressed the doorbell and I panicked when I did. And I placed the roses quickly on the ground in front of the door with the card and I took off running and jumped into the bushes by the driveway. <laughs> so I'm hiding in the bushes. And all of a sudden, I see the light on the front porch come on. I'm trying to be as quiet as I can. And someone walks out on the front porch. And it was the person I didn't want to see walk out on the front porch. That's right. His daddy's coming out there. <laughs> so I'm like not moving a muscle. He's yelling if anybody was there. Eventually, he grabbed everything went back inside, closed the door, turned the light off. I went back to the house, and I went to the, to the room that had a view of her house. And I grabbed the phone next to me, and I cracked the blinds, and I was waiting. Waiting for a call, waiting for her to come jumping out of the back door and running over to my house. And I waited, and I waited, and she never came. I know, it was the worst decision she ever made. Believe me, all right? She's regretting it now. <laughs> it was an awkward drive to school the next morning because nothing was really said and she moved on, I moved on. And I think about that because I think we all can kind of relate to experiences like that, not necessarily with the crush, though, that maybe, you know, instigating your first one, you know, is a little bit difficult. But, you know, we all find ourselves from time to time in life with some things that we want that we don't have or some things that are in our life that need to change and we don't know what to do about it but we know that something has to be done and my guess is for some of us in this room those that are watching is that you you might be at a doorbell ringing moment like a moment where you got to do something about where you're at in contrast to where you need to be or what needs to happen in your life and there's one way that we deal with things in our life that are, that shouldn't be, or the status quo in our life, some, th some things that need to change that aren't changing. And we say to ourselves, or I say to myself, you know, someday I'm going to take care of this. 
Someday I'm going to do something about that. And of course, the challenge is, is that someday is not an actual day of the week. And today, today was yesterday's Sunday. Like someday, like today is that day. And there's some things that are persisting in our life. And uh, so let me just do this. How many of you would, would self-identify, okay, you would self-identify as a procrastinator? Any procrastinators here? I see your hand. Okay, some of you are going to raise your hand in about 10 seconds. You put it all. Okay, that's a, there's a lot more procrastinators in the second service than the first. I'm, but we all, I, I'm, a, I'm a huge procrastinator. I put things off. I usually joke about it. You know, say things like, you know, I'm, I'm not a procrastinator. I just work better under pressure. You know, I need deadlines. I've done lots of all-nighters, you know, to get ready for something, to get prepared for something I didn't do anything about. And I don't, but, but the challenge is, is I don't think we really consider how much procrastination costs us. Because it, it can actually cost us a whole lot. And I want to look at James chapter 4. If you have a Bible, you can go there. If not, it's going to be on the screen. And James chapter 4 has some real serious things to, to say to, specifically to pro procrastinators. Verse 13, it says, Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this city, or that city, and spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Verse 14, why you do not even know what will happen to you tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will do this or do that. As it is, you boast in your arrogant schemes, and all such boasting is evil. And here's the statement I really want to focus on today. He says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it's sin for them. You know, you might be accustomed to hearing messages preached about sin, but usually whenever you hear it, it's about the bad stuff you need to stop doing. And that's an important message. And rarely, and not, not enough, do we think about sin as, as the things that are, that are absent in our life, not the things that are present. That, that sometimes, in order for us to address real debilitating sin in our life, it's not a matter of stopping, it's a matter of starting. There's things we need to do, but we're not doing. And so I want to make this really personal and practical today, and I want you to think about it, and this may be different for every one of us. Okay, and I have some things as well. When you think about your life, what is the good thing you ought to be doing, but you're not doing? And it could be real practical. It could be working on your health. It could be pursuing a relationship. It could be mending a broken relationship. It could be addressing a, a, an addiction in your life. It could be sharing your faith. It could be pursuing some ministry thing that you have in your heart. It could be reading your Bible more. I don't know what it is. It could be serving on a team, uh, you know, leading a group, whatever it may be, what is the good thing you know in your heart you ought to be doing, but you're not? And, and that's really, I want us to be practical so we can leave here and make a difference. How many want to show up at church, hear a good message, and some things actually change in your life? Well, in order to do that, we got to start thinking now, what are we going to do? What are we going to do about it? And here's the simple truth today is that if you don't, if you don't do what you ought to do today, you won't be who you ought to be tomorrow. Like today is, is a huge moment. And like what we do today, it will affect our life 10 years from now. The things that we do in the future. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12 says, In fact, though by this time, everybody say by this time. By this time, you ought to be teachers, but instead you need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. He's saying, by this time, you ought to be further along. If you took advantage of the moments back then and gave them your full attention and do what you needed to then, you'd be at a different place today. And as difficult as it is to admit, because this is deeply challenging, and I don't mean any shame or guilt, but I'm going to meddle a little bit today. Is that all right? All right, I'm going to do it anyway. Some of y'all ought to be further along now. 
Some of you ought to be mentors. Some of you ought to be teachers. Some of you ought to have an example-setting lifestyle of faith for other people. And no shame in this. That's why we're here today, all right? But we have to address the real challenging truth in us is that what we do today matters. And here's the deal. We're all time travelers. But the bad news is, is we only move in one direction. You can't go back. I wish I could. How many of you wish you could go back and change some things about the past? I, I've said before that if time travel existed, I'd go back, punch my 16-year-old self in the face. You know, that's what I would do. Some things that you did back then you wish you couldn't do. You can't do that, but you can make some choices and some decisions about what you do from this moment on. And here's the deal. As a pastor, and I know that for some of you, maybe in your own experience, there's nothing more challenging to overcome than a painful past. And some of us are here today trying to address issues that happened in our life decades ago, years ago, months ago. And it's very difficult to get over our past in order to move into the future. So we know that. Now let's take that knowledge and apply it today. Because here's the deal. Your present today, your present will be the past that affects your future. Like today is the day choices that you make, things that you do today will be what you look back on 10, for, 10 years from now in either great gladness and joy because you got some things right or more regret, compounding regret because we didn't address the things that we need to address today. We need to make the most of this moment. And in order for things to change, it has to move beyond just wanting them to change. It's like Zig Ziglar said, hoping is not a strategy. Like, hope is great. Like, we need hopes for the future. I hope you have high hopes for the future. But just because you want the future to be a certain way doesn't mean that it will. Something has to be done about it. We have to make some choices and some decisions. So I'm going to give us four things to consider today. Four things to consider. And let me just say this up front. This is going to be a very simple message. Like, it's going to be bottom shelf stuff. Everybody can have access to it. If you came going, wow, you know, a guest preacher is going to say something I'd never heard before, you're probably going to be disappointed, all right? But here's the deal. How many of you have discovered there's a difference between simple and easy? I mean, I know how to lose weight. It's pretty simple. Eat less, work out more. But how many know that doesn't mean it's easy to do? All right, so this is going to be very simple, but not simplistic. It's going to require real effort and real challenge. And the first thing we're going to have to do, again, thinking about the thing that we need to be doing, we're not doing, is we're going to have to can the excuses. We're going to have to get over the excuses that we have. How many have discovered that if you want to find an excuse, one will always be found? There's, there's always, there's so many good excuses. There's so many things that keep us, and, you know, myself included, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm great at making excuses. And you know, Benjamin Franklin said, he who is good at making excuses is seldom good at anything else. And that's so true. we got to get over our excuses. And, and here's the challenge when it comes to my excuses, okay? Your excuses are lame. My excuses are reasonable. Right? Have you ever heard anybody give you all the excuses as to why not be like, that's so silly and lame. And then you tell them your excuses and be like, that makes absolute sense. Now I know why. It's personal for me. So we all have good intentions, we know that, right? We have good intentions about what we want, what we want to pursue, but we got to convert those good intentions into the right kind of action. And in order for us to do that, we're going to have to get by all the excuses. It's amazing, whenever you read the Bible and you see how God shows up and he begins to use people in the Bible, how often it is that those people that God chooses, they have to push through the excuses they have as to why they can't do what's being asked of them. Moses said, I can't lead these people. I don't even know. I'm not even good at speaking. I have a speech impediment. Gideon says, who, you want to use me in this? I, I'm the weakest member of the weakest family in this community. You can pick somebody else. Jeremiah, he says, God, you know, I'm too young to do this. I mean, on and on and on. There's excuses everywhere throughout it, and we have to figure out how to navigate through the natural excuses that come that oftentimes keep us from what God has for us. It reminds me of the story about two brothers that grew up in the same home, same father. And both of their father, the same man, was very abusive and an alcoholic. And they grew up in that environment. 
And yet, those two boys ended up in two very different places. One of the one of the boys, tragically, like many people that come from those environments, ended up reflecting his father and was an alcoholic himself that became a very violent person. And at the same time, there was another brother, another son, that grew up in the same environment but had a very different outcome. He was kind and tender-hearted, uh, wasn't an alcoholic, wasn't a violent man in any way. And the first son was asked, how is it that you became what you became? Why are you an alcoholic and an abusive man? And he says, because that's what my daddy was. And the same person goes over to the other son that had a different outcome and it says, how is it that you ended up not becoming violent and an alcoholic? And he says, because that's what my daddy was. I just think it's such an interesting thing that the same excuse can be either fuel for us to move forward or it can be the thing that actually keeps us. We get to choose our excuses, but we got to navigate through them. Come on, somebody. We got to get past our excuses. We got to assume personal responsibility for our life, regardless of what happened. And in order for us to do that, we're going to have to do something really difficult, and that is to get honest with ourselves. And allowing the veneer and the coping mechanism we oftentimes use to excuse away why we're not further along or not why we're not where we want to be is we're going to have to address these excuses. In order for us to do that, we're going to have to do some hard things. How many have discovered? that a large part of maturity is learning how to do the right thing regardless of how we feel. That maturity in many ways is the result of mastering our feelings and our mood. And the challenge is, is our feelings are the most influential yet most unreliable guides in our life. And yet we're, we move motivated by it. But we got to make a choice to do the right thing. How many of you here, how often would you show up at work if you only showed up at work when you felt like going to work. <laughs> right? How many think you'd have a job now if that's the only time you showed up? <laughs> and, and that's so true. So we got to get past this. We got to get past the excuse. We have to make some choices because we don't want to just cope with things as they are. Whatever the thing may be in your life that needs to be addressed, relationships. Maybe it's saying yes to Jesus. Maybe you're here today and you're like, you know, I know I need to trust Jesus with my life. I need to give him my whole heart, trust him with my future. But I got some things to iron out. I got some, I got some things I want to experience. I got some things I need to get together. Those are all excuses. We've got to learn to make the right choices. And maybe some of you are here and you're like, I, I do the thing that I want to do, but I don't know how. I don't know how to, you know, how, how would I pursue some kind of ministry ambition? Or how would I seek help for an addiction or how would I share my faith and that may be an understandable excuse because not knowing how it, it is, is understandable right and uh, how many of you remember let me just ask this how many of you remember the Dewey Decimal System anybody remember that let me see your hands these are all the old people raising their hands right now I'm with you I'm with you right Dewey Decimal like for the young people it was like a it was like a code that you use when you showed up at the library to get information that you needed. Be like, I'm looking for this book. It's 1774.00- all that. They were like, you go right down there to the third row on the bookshelf, top right, there it is, boom. Now they have this thing. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's called Google. You ever heard of that? <laughs> okay, the Dewey Decimal System is like Google 35 years ago, all right? But now you can go on Google, literally, whatever it is that you need help for, whatever it is you're looking for, whatever information you have, and you can literally plug in a question, and you'll get all kinds of responses. Like this morning, I typed in, how do I share my faith? 17 million responses to that question. Right? And our problem is not we don't have enough information. Our problem is we got too much. Like if you don't know how to do you can go to YouTube. It's an amazing thing. Anybody else use YouTube to figure out how to do stuff? I mean, you learn how to, how to play the guitar, how to fix your car, how to perform surgery. It's all on YouTube. <laughs> like, if I'm at a stopping point, I just say, like, YouTube, and somebody shows me how to do it. It's amazing. So if you're here and you'll be like, I would, but I don't know how, let me follow up the question by saying, have you asked for help? Because now you know that Google exists. You know, you really can't use that excuse like we used to use. And this, this church is full of people that are willing to help, to help navigate, take you on this journey of faith, or help you to pursue ministry. I love the vision of the college here, and the, the emphasis on developing and training leaders. 
I love the emphasis on recovery, where if you have a hurt, if you have a hang-up, if you have a habit in your life that needs to be broken, this is a good place for it. You're in a safe place where you can ask questions, and you can ask for help. And there's a verse in James that says, if you lack wisdom, you don't know what to do, ask for it. And he will give you wisdom without finding fault. So you got to ask for help. And it will be given to us. But the challenge is, is oftentimes doing the right thing is rarely easy or convenient. It oftentimes comes at the wrong time and it comes at a high price. Ecclesiastes 11.4 says, farmers who wait for perfect weather never plant. If you watch every cloud, they never harvest. Proverbs 24 says, if you won't plow in the cold, you won't eat in the harvest. So sometimes it's hard to do. It's like not a convenient time. It's not ideal. And so we keep putting it off. We've got to can the excuses. Everybody say can the excuses. Can. And the second thing is you've got, you got to just start. You've got to just start. You've got to just press the button. You've got to make the phone call. You've got to fill out the application. You've got to send, out, send an email. You have to send up a prayer. You have to step out. You've got to be willing to just start but of course that's a real challenge it's like i don't know if you've heard this but did you know that a rocket burns more fuel getting off the launch pad than it does staying in orbit sometimes just getting started is the hardest part and if you can just get started everything else sort of falls in line it's like i don't know if you know which what is the hardest piece of equipment to use in a gym that's right the front door right it's harder than the bench press. It's harder than anything. Anything else you do is the front door. Right? You just got to get started. You have to begin moving towards the thing that you have in your life. I love the psalm in Psalm 119. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light for my path. It's saying that here's how you get clarity for your journey is you, you can see what's right in front of you. And you see enough to take another step. And then you can take another step and you can continue to walk in this journey. It's an unfolding journey of faith. But the thing about it is, is I don't know if you're like me, but I'm kind of a long-term planner. I want to see a little bit further than what's right in front of me. Okay, I want to know what's around the corner. And he said, no, 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 I don't, you don't need to know what's around the corner. Chances are, if you knew what was around the corner, you might not trust me right here. But what I want you to do is see that I have, you have everything you need to take the next step and as you take that step you have enough information to see to take another step and another step and a succession amount of steps but it does mean that there's things that are hidden and dark and I don't know about you but I oftentimes pray God I just need clarity just give me clarity God I'd move maybe you're here and you think I'd, I'd begin to do something about it but I, I need more information you're waiting on more information. Can I, can I let you in on maybe some bad news? There's a good chance more information is not coming. I can, no, no. Your word, it's a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. What that means is, is as I walk, the things that I don't see, that I don't have clarity on, all of a sudden opens up for me. Whenever I go to God and I pray for clarity, Lord, I need clarity about this situation. I feel like the Holy Spirit responds by saying, that's what I'm trying to get you to give up on. Because clarity oftentimes is just another way of saying, I need control of this situation. And he's saying, no, no, I want you to surrender this ideal of clarity, and I want you to trust me for the journey. And as you trust me, I will open up and I'll bring clarity into every situation. And that metaphor is a powerful thing. It says that clarity comes as a result of continuing to walk, that clarity comes by walking, not by waiting. That as I walk down this life, as I trust God with my life and my future, he shows, shows me things that I didn't see before. But he ain't going to show it to me until I get to where I need. Amen to that? <laughs> Luke 12 is an amazing verse. Jesus is preparing his disciples that following me is going to, you're going to get hostility and people might actually arrest you. You might have to give an account to this. And he's warning them about what's coming into the future. And he says, he says, when you're brought before synagogues, rulers, and authorities, do not worry about how you will defend yourself or what you will say. Verse 12, for the Holy Spirit will teach you at what time? 
at that time what you should say. The Holy Spirit will teach you at that time. Now, I don't know about you, but this verse confronts my personality. Because I need to be prepared for whatever I'm getting into. And he said, no, 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 no. What I, what I need you to do is live life dependent on the Holy Spirit, trusting that you'll get what you need. And in that moment, if you live your life dependent and trusting, he will give you what you need at that time. And the challenge for getting started, you know, became clear. You know, I was meeting with a friend of mine, part of our church, counseling in a marriage uh, crisis situation. Both of them love Jesus, and they were at a season at a time that every marriage ends up eventually and inevitably where they needed some help. And so I'm there helping them through a process and was meeting with the husband, and they'd gone distant. There was walls between them and didn't know what to do about it, tried date nights, all the typical stuff. And I said, I tell you what, here's what I want you to do is I want you every day this week to pray with your wife. Like, take some time. It doesn't have to be long. You don't have to turn it into a long, drawn-out prayer meeting. You don't have to be high and mighty. You don't have to pray for revival. You're not, you're not having, you know, this is just, it doesn't have to be theologically, you know, lofty. It can be very simple, just on a daily basis. Connect with your wife on a spiritual level, and you'll see a bond develop like nothing else. He goes, that's good, Pastor. I'll take that, and I'll do that. So then a week goes by, and I meet with him the second time, and he comes back the second time, and he said, and I say, how did it go? And he said, I got to say, we didn't do it. We wanted to do it. We, we needed to do it, but we didn't do it. And I said, well, why didn't you do it? And he says, because it would make me feel awkward. It would make us feel awkward. We haven't, we haven't done this before. I don't know what to say. And here's what I've discovered for so much, so many of us, what's keeping us from doing what we need to do or keeping us from changing things that need to change is the feeling that comes with stepping out in a new place. Awkward. So here's the, here's the third thing is you got to embrace awkward. It's awkward to share your faith. It feels awkward to say hello to somebody and to pursue a relationship. It's awkward to say I'm sorry and to try to rebuild something. I don't know how they're going to respond. It's it's awkward. If you if you are not in, if you've gotten out of shape and you show back up at the gym to work out for the first time in a long time, how many know it's awkward? Everybody else got their pretty gym clothes on. You know, they got it all together and you're you're wearing as baggy sweatpants and shirt as you could possibly find. That's awkward. It's awkward. I remember the first time I preached, it was so awkward. It was awkward for everybody. It was so awkward for me and for everybody that heard it that day. <laughs> but here's the deal. We can't allow our insecurities and our fear to keep us from doing the thing we need to do. And it happens so often. I love what Deborah Brown says. She says, one day you'll wonder what was so important that you put off doing the most important things. Someday can be a thief in the night. So true. This is what James says. You're like a mist that appears for a little while and then is gone. Why do you boast about tomorrow? You're not promised tomorrow. You can't presume anything about the future. Take advantage and do what you need to do right now. And if you're here today and you've allowed some knowledge to go by before you've addressed things and you're thinking there's some things that have compounded and I'm not sure I can get back to that, how many are grateful that God not only forgives us of our past, forgives us of our sin, but he restores and he redeems our past and he brings us into a bright and a fresh future? So the last thing is it's not too late now. It's not too late now. I hear people all the time say, it's never too late. You're like, that ain't true. There's coming a time where it is too late. But the good news is, that time ain't right now. You're here. You're breathing. Your heart's beating. There's still opportunity in front of you. If you have today, then it's not too late. But don't presume about what's to come tomorrow. There's some things that have to be done right now. And you say to yourself, well, there's too much to be undone. Well, that's not the case. I see testimonies and stories of how God has worked and weaved his story and plan to replace the years that the locusts have devoured from all the poor choices in order to restore and redeem. I've seen broken relationships become whole. I see people get a late start in life and God used them in dramatic ways. You know, when you read the New Testament, you know, my favorite character in the Bible, certainly in the New Testament, is, is the Apostle Paul. I mean, he is, it's incredible. He's just an amazing leader. Someone is gifted to lead, missionary, 
planter, pastor, leader, developer. I mean, God used in an amazing way. Certainly, maybe nobody else in the whole Bible did God use in such a dramatic fashion to lead God's church into a new era, in our era, where now much of what we know about God and how he relates to us is because of this man writing this, this text for us by the Holy Spirit the colossal apostle. But most of the time when we read his words, we don't read it for where he got his start at or where he was. Let me read one of my favorite verses. Sometimes it's referred to as Paul's epitaph. It's at the end of his life to his son Timothy. He says, I'm already being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And those are three things that we need in order to have a legacy in our life. I fought the right fight. I completed the task. And I held on to what I need to hold on to along the way. And now there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. Not only me, but also to all those who long for his appearance. I love that someone can say with confidence is I did everything that was required. I chose the right fight to pursue. But if I'm honest, my life doesn't reflect that oftentimes. And maybe for you, you're like, I wish it did, but it doesn't. But Paul's story and his testimony reminds us that it's not how you start that matters, but it's how you finish. And that Paul is a man that can stand with confidence to say he's been faithful to God's call on his life, though for much of his life, he was persecuting God and persecuting Christians. He was a religious terrorist that wanted to destroy this new Jesus movement that that God redeemed and restored. And now he's someone that can stand with confidence and say, I've finished this race. I've accomplished the task. I've kept the race. That's good news. Some of you are known for things you don't want to be known for. Well, Paul says, I know how that feels. You know, there's people that know a different Josh Lipscomb than my church does. How many of you have discovered that everybody's got a reputation with somebody? Yeah. But here's the good news that Paul tells us is that your reputation doesn't have to be your legacy. The thing that you were known for doesn't have to be the thing that you are known for in the future if you begin to do the things you need to do right now. We bow our heads to close. What do you need to do about the thing you're not doing? And when will you do it? If there's a phone call that needs to be made, I want you to impulsively make that call. If there's some relationship that's broken, I want you to not just have an idea and a plan and say, Monday, I'm going to take care of it. No, no, no. Today's that day. And I believe you're standing on the front door step looking at a doorbell. Will you make that decision to press that doorbell? For others in here, you don't have a relationship with God. Your relationship with God is not where it needs to be. And and you're here today, not because someone invited you or because it's convenient to be here, but because you know in your heart that today is the day that you trust Him with your life. Don't put it off. Please, right now, right now, your many heads are being filled with excuses. You don't know everything. You You haven't done everything that needs to be done. But today is a day. That's what the scripture says, that, that, that now is a time of God's favor. And today is the day of salvation. And I believe many people in this room and those that are watching online, that you're going to trust Jesus for the first time or others are going to return back to him. And in just a moment, I'm going to lead us all in a prayer. And I believe that there's serious things that are happening in the lives of so many people here today. With every, bow, every head bowed and every eye closed, let's pray this prayer together, would you? Sincerely especially those that need it, need to trust Jesus with your life. Repeat after me if you can. Say, Jesus, thank you for loving me and not giving up on me. Today, I put my faith in you. I believe that you came, that you died, and you rose again for me. Forgive me of my past and my sin. Make me new. My future is yours. I'll follow you every day from today. In Jesus' name.
Thank you for watching today's message. My name is Ashley, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. First, we want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is take a next step on your journey, and we would love to help you do that. You can head on over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started today.